Hello all my urinologists and nephrologists and nurses. I have for you here a very good urinary system video and the whole thing will take less than an hour. And we're going to divide it into two parts. First, we're going to look at the macroscopic structures and regions of the urinary system. And second, I'm going to show you everything you need to know about the functional unit of the kidney, the nephron. And I'm going to put it all on one sheet of paper as if you're taking notes yourself. All right, let's get to it. Macroscopically, the urinary system consists of four parts. Since the kidney's job is blood homeostasis, let's follow the blood from the heart. So here's the heart, you got the aorta, and then to the renal artery. Let's zoom in here just a little bit. So here's the left kidney, then urine is d drains down the ureter, down to the urinary bladder, here it is and then finally out the urethra. Here's a frontal cross-section of the right kidney. Just kind of take a look here. This is, this is the right kidney here. You can say there are three main regions, three main regions, and you have things inside of these three main regions. Here's what we call the renal cortex. This is the renal cortex. All of this outer shell, all of this out here is the renal cortex. The second region is what we call the renal medulla. All of this that's not the outside shell and not the white. This is the renal medulla. And the renal medulla consists of these little triangles, these renal pyramid here, one, two, three, four. These are renal pyramids. And in between the renal pyramids, we have renal column, renal column. The third region is the renal pelvis. All this is, we can call this all the renal pelvis. And this is what the urine drains into. The first parts of these tubes are called minor calyces. So here's a minor calyx, minor calyx, minor calyx, like that. And the minor calyces drain into the next, where they merge, those are called major calyces. So here's a major calyx here. Here's another one, major calyx. And then those then merge to the, the, the bottom part of the renal pelvis. And then, of course, down and out the ureter. Now, if you look at these tiny little yellow tubes up here, these are the nephrons of the kidneys. Now we're going to spend 90% of our time studying the physiology of the nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. Well, there happens to be two kinds of nephrons, and their names are based on where they are found in the kidney. The cortical nephron is primarily in the cortex, and the juxtamedullary nephron is the second one. Its entire nephron loop is found in the pyramid, which is in the medulla, hence the name juxtamedullary nephron. So is there any difference between the function of the cortical nephron and the juxtamedullary nephron? Yes, simply put, the juxtamedullary nephron's loop makes the greatest contribution to the osmotic gradient which is critical to being able to conserve water when dehydrated. I won't expect you to know any more than that as far as differences between the two nephrons. Let me start by walking you through the five regions of the nephron. So first we have the renal corpuscle right here. Then we have the proximal convoluted tubule or the PCT. We have the nephron loop and you can subdivide this into the descending limb of the nephron loop and the ascending limb of the nephron loop. Fourth we have the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule. And finally we have the collecting duct. All right, so let's begin with this, the first region, the, the renal corpuscle. We can divide this into two parts. We have the glomerular capsule, which is this outer shell, and then we have the glomerulus, which is just this capillary here. And this whole thing really starts with um, blood entering the kidneys, going through a set of different vessels, and finally hitting what we call the afferent arterial. Afferent with an A because it's going towards the, um, the, the, the renal corpuscle. So blood, blood is flowing through here, the afferent arterial, then it enters the, um, 
the the uh, the glomerulus and it's here that it's filtered from here into this filter it space here and and this is where the uh, the 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 fluid continues on now it's important for you to know what is filtered through and what can't get through and ends up going in, continuing on into the efferent arterial so there are three things um that I want you to 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 know that um are too big that can't get through the um through the uh through the walls here one is your red blood cells those are too big white blood cells and protein these three things are too large to get through and so they continue on in the the blood vessel here and just can continue on and, and eventually exit red blood cells white blood cells and proteins everything else in the blood can make it through and once it does make it through it's called filter it it's called filter it that's when it's like right in here okay filter it and what so what are we talking here well everything everything else in the blood we're talking water amino acids sodium potassium calcium glucose um your 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 um your your toxins your poisons uh urea uric acid all that stuff that's in the blood does actually filter through and enter the tubule that way how so my next question is by what mechanism by what mechanism it's by pressure by pressure um the fluid is able to get from the glomerulus into this capsular space here and eventually into your your PCT not by osmosis not by active transport but we say by 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 pressure we're able to filter through and this process is called filtration the fluid is actually called filtrate once it enters once all this stuff enters the PCT it's now called tubular fluid tubular fluid now what's interesting here is that 70% of all the blood that we just got done filtering into the tube leaves the tube once again and goes right back into the blood 70%. So what then uh exits the tube and enters the the blood once again we're talking calcium, potassium, sodium, amino acids, glucose, water, 60% of the of the water that's flowing through here goes right back into the blood in through the um uh, in the uh, th through the PCT. Now there's a couple of terms that I want you to be familiar with. If the if the um if the ions and molecules are exiting the tube, this is called absorption. So you think like, no, this is not absorption. If it's leaving, it's not absorption. Well, it's 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 called absorption because it's going to be absorbed by the blood which is going to go right back to our bodies. If it stays in the tube, or if it enters the tube, this is called secretion. Why secretion? Well, because anything that um, stays in the tube will eventually be urinated out. So we call it secretion. Okay, so be familiar, you guys, with those two things. Absorption, or you can, you can say absorption or reabsorption, and that is to exit out of the tube and into the blood and secretion means to enter or to just stay in whatever stays in the tube will eventually be excreted out of the out of the body there's a couple other things that i want you to, to know that uh ends up ex being secreted and that is your four nitrogenous wastes you have urea uric acid creatinine and ammonia and the largest component of these is urea. The largest percentage of nitrogenous waste is your urea. These end up um, being secreted into the PCT um, and uh, for for and and ready to be uh, disposed of out of the body. Okay, so. 
so the tubular fluid continues on, it continues on, it continues on, and eventually it hits the nephron loop. But we have to subdivide this into the descending and ascending. Why? Well, because one thing happens here and another thing happens here. Look at how many things was were reabsorbed in the PCT. We're talking water, calcium, potassium, sodium, amino acids, glucose. There's only one thing. There, there's actually a few things, but there's one. There's only one thing that I really care for you to know, that I want you to know, that I'm expecting you to know, and that is water. What is water doing here? It's being reabsorbed. It's leaving the descending limb of the nephron loop and going right back to the blood. In the ACE, and that's it. So that's that's the end of that story. There is a, there's a couple other things that I want to talk about, or the, or, or the mechanism by which mechanism, but uh, we'll we'll say that just for a second. So so far, what we know is that fluid is uh, filtrate is able to be made by filtration, and that's by pressure. That's by pressure. Then we have um, a whole everything else that's in the blood that wasn't. Um, uh, every everything else, um, all the stuff that was that just got into the the tube is now being reabsorbed right back into the blood. That's at the PCT. What are the three th the three components of blood that I want you to know that doesn't actually enter the tube? Your red blood cells, white blood cells, and your protein. This is done by active transport. This is done. These things are move by active transport. Then we have water being reabsorbed. This is done by osmosis. Then we then in the ascending loop, sodium and chloride ions are being reabsorbed into the blood. That's by active transport. Then we have variable amount of water in the DCT that can be reabsorbed and also in the collecting duct that can be reabsorbed as well as some toxins and that stuff and that stuff can be secreted in other words enter um, enter the, the the tube one more time let's just go through um, let's go through the, the the first region and what what stuff moves here Everything moves from the glomerulus into the capsular space here and into the PCT. We're talking everything in the blood. We're talking even, uh, you know, even bicarbonate. I mean, calcium, potassium, sodium, amino acids, glucose, water. The only things that can't get through and that continue on out the efferent arterial and, and along. That's your red blood cells, white blood cells, and protein. Then in the PCT, everything goes right, 70% of this stuff goes right back into the blood. In the descending limb, water is being reabsorbed. In the ascending limb, sodium chloride is being reabsorbed into the blood. Then we have a variable amount of water, depending on if we're overhydrated or dehydrated. In the DCT, we have water being reabsorbed and some toxins being secreted going into the tube. Same thing with the uh, with the collecting duct. Water being we can we can reabsorb water if we need if we're dehydrated, and also some toxins um, can enter the tube here to to be eliminated. By what mechanism? Filtration, blood pressure filtration, active transport, osmosis, active transport, and then. Um, these are done by osmosis and um, by by some hormones like aldosterone and ADH. Okay, another thing I wanted to note here: notice the the size, the di the diameter of the afferent arterial compared to the efferent arterial. It's it's almost like the you see how it's larger there's a larger diameter here than here this is how we create blood pressure in order to move the molecules 
from the glomerulus into the 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 PCT. This is this is how it's done. It's it's like you're kinking the hose on this side and therefore the fil the, the the blood needs to go somewhere and therefore it's able to create this this um this pressure and able to flow in. So just I just want you to realize that the efferent side is is um is has a, a smaller diameter than the afferent side. Okay. Next thing I, I want you to, to 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 realize here is that let's see here. We are we are sending blood into the kidneys, into the tube, then we're taking most of it right back out of the tube, back into our blood, and sending it around and going right back to the body. So why would we do that? Well, because the goal of the nephron is blood homeostasis and if we are uh if we have a healthy diet then there there then this is what we should expect 70 percent and, and everything goes right back now if we are overhydrated or underhydrated of course we'd rather be overhydrated than underhydrated um then that's where we, you'll have variable actions over here in the DCT and in the PC and, and in the collecting duct. There's a couple of words I want you to be familiar with, a couple more words. You have obligatory water reabsorption and you have facultative water reabsorption. Where is the obligatory uh, components? The renal corpuscle is obligatory the PCT obligatory water absorption and the nephron loop every this these three parts these things happen with these percentages no matter what whether you're hydrated or dehydrated these things will happen with these percentages now where you do have variable or facultative water reabsorption that will occur in the DCT and the collecting duct. So, so if you are overhydrated, these numbers that what's what's absorbed here will change, and if you're dehydrated, what's absorbed here will change. What I have for you here, I actually have some some numbers. These are numbers. These are the concentration of the fluid at each of these points. The reason why this is 300 milliosmoles per liter is because our blood is actually at homeo at homeostasis. Our blood is at 300 milliosmoles per liter, and so it it makes sense that it would be also 300 right away, right after it moves here, because pretty much everything moves from the glomerulus to the PCT, pretty much all of our blood, remember? Everything moves except for these three components. So you'd think that the concentration of our of our tubular fluid would be pretty much the same, and, and, and in fact it is. Now, what is interesting is that as it moves, the number begins to go up. The concentration goes up, up, 300, 400, 500, 600, all the way to 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. Why is that happening? Why is the concentration going up? The reason why the concentration goes up is because water is being pulled out. Water is being reabsorbed, pulled out of the tube, back into the blood, and therefore you're having a smaller and smaller amount of volume of water, therefore you have more and more and more solute, therefore you have more concentration. Then, then, then for some reason, the concentration begins to drop. 1,200, 1,100, 1,000, 500, all the way to 100. Why is that now? We were, we were at 300, we went all to 1,200, and now we're going back down. Why is the concentration dropping in the ascending limb? Well, that's because the solute now is leaving. Sodium and chloride is now exiting the tube and entering the 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 blood the the blood capillary so 
my question then is why is this ha why 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 is this then happening well it's called counter current multiplication when blood travels around and around and around like this it's it's actually going the opposite direction of the nephron loop you see here uh, sorry of the nephron you see here the nephron is moving down and then back up whereas the um whereas the blood capillary here is actually moving this direction so so the the fluid is moving while the fluid is moving from left to right the blood in the capillary is moving from right to left and because of this this is called counter current multiplication why well because chlor sodium and chloride are are being dumped into the um into the blood and therefore the concentration drops here but it increases in the blood so now by the time it gets over here you have a very 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 high concentration of 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 this of these ions by the time we get over here and that's why osmosis occurs at the at the descending limb of the nephron loop that's why water is pulled out of here in the first place because the blood is actually coming around this direction and, be, and becomes of gets uh, ends up having a very high concentration by the time it gets over here because it actually hits the ascend the, the ascending limb first soaking up all those sodiums and those chlorides so by the time we get over here we have a high concentration that's why so that's why water is then being reabsorbed and and uh, back to the body okay <clears throat> now if you are if you are not dehydrated and not overhydrated you will have a concentration in your urine just like in your blood 300 milliosmoles per liter you're 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 drinking and you're consuming the perfect amount of sodium and potassium and calcium and and uh and 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 um and water if you are if you are able to do that that's kind of hard but that's that that's that's it's possible if you drink more water than you than you are drinking uh consuming salt and sodium and chloride then in other then you'll be overhydrated if you're overhydrated you're going to have a very small number a smaller number than 300 why because this number represents the concentration so you'll have a small concentration because you're going to have so much water therefore you have a small number and that's actually healthy i mean that's fairly he that that's that's healthy to have a, a a concentration of say 200 over here if we were to sample the the urine over here 200 or 100 or 50 you'll be overhydrated that's good that's fine that's good well in the example that i have here for you we actually have a very 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 high concentration this means that we are dehydrated here and this is the reason why um, the concentration continues to go up 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 why does the concentration go up the concentration goes up because at every one of these points water is trying to get reabsorbed into the blood because we are so dang dehydrated it's and that's why we have nothing we have we have, we're at such a gradient such a a vast gradient by the time we get down here because we're constantly pulling water out because we're so dehydrated so if you have a concentration of 1200 or even 400 or 500 by the time you're down here in the collecting duct you know you're dehydrated you have a higher concentration which means um, less water more solute so I hope that makes sense to you guys okay now um, 
We've talked about what's going on at the renal corpuscle. We know that it's, it's by filtration that everything gets dumped into the capsular space and into the uh, PCT, except for your red blood cells, white blood cells, and proteins. Proximal convoluted tubule, this is active transport, 70% of what we just got done dumping into the tube here goes right back into the blood. And we also have we also have so, some secretion of waste, nitrogenous waste, primarily urea, but we also have uric acid and creatinine and ammonia. In the descending limb of the nephron loop, we have reabsorption of water. And in the ascending loop, we have reabsorption of uh, soybean chloride by osmosis over here and active transport over here. In the distal convoluted tubule, we have facultative water reabsorption, and in this case, we are definitely reabsorbing water because we are dehydrated. And, and then finally, in the collecting duct, this is our last chance to, to, to take up any water that we need. After that, there is no more chance and there's no way, there's no more that we, no, nowhere else that we can reabsorb that water. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, um, uh, also in the DCT, we, we, have, uh, we do have, um, if we are dehydrated, we can exchange sodium for potassium. Uh, uh, sorry, we can exchange potassium uh, for sodium and... and um, and pump more sodiums into our blood. If we can pump more sodium into our blood here, then we can pull even more water into the blood, and therefore we can increase our our blood volume and and uh, and and regain blood pressure. We can also do the same thing with a sodium hydrogen pump. <coughs> we can donate um, hydrogens give hydrogens to the um, um, to the tube in exchange for sodium and do the same thing. So we have sodium potassium pumps that can work in the DCT. We can uh, we, we, al we also have sodium hydrogen pumps that can also work in the DCT. All right, a couple of a couple of hormones here. We got aldosterone, we got ADH, we got angiotensin 2. Let's talk about aldosterone here. So, aldosterone is secreted from the uh, from your little tri those little triangle um, organs right above the kidneys. Those are your adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands secrete aldosterone, and aldosterone works on the DCT and on the collecting duct. How? By what mechanism? Well, it, it exchanges, again, um, potassium for sodium. Aldosterone can help when you are low, when you have low blood pressure or when you uh, are dehydrated. When you're dehydrated or when you have low blood pressure, the, um, the adrenal glands, the adrenal glands, can secrete aldosterone, reach the kidneys, and specifically the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, and, and secrete potassium into the DCT in exchange for sodium, and the same idea. You increase the amount of sodium in the capillary here and therefore increase the amount of water that we're able to absorb out of the, the descending limb and into the capillary and back to the blood. Aldosterone works by increasing the permeability of sodium in the DCT and in the collecting duct. Antidiuretic hormone, anti diuretic hormone. Anti means to stop, diuretic means to pee hormone. So this is your stop pee hormone. Who makes this? This is the pituitary, the pituitary in the, up in the brain, 
secretes a, 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 antidiuretic hormone <coughs> ADH reaches the again the same two regions your DCT and collecting duct and it it increases the amount of aquaporins and thereby increasing the amount of water permeability and therefore you increase the 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 amount of water that's being absorbed into the uh, out of the um, the tube and back into the blood ADH works on the DCT and the collecting duct so when you're dehydrated this hormone aldosterone can act on the DCT and the collecting duct and this hormone can also act on the DCT and the collecting duct the pituitary makes ADH and the adrenal glands make aldosterone we also have this angiotensin 2 that we got to talk about in order to talk about angiotensin 2 we got to talk about this juxtaglomerular complex that's right here this juxtaglomerular complex is the junction of the afferent arterial and the DCT. You notice how I kind of stretched out the DCT so that it comes here. You notice how it bisects. So this is actually uh, what, what occurs in our nephrons. It actually bisects the, um, the afferent and efferent arterioles. And it's the, these specialized cells of the DCT called the macula densa. The macula densa cells sample the amount of sodium and chloride and potassium flowing through here. Now, if the amounts are too little, that must mean that there's low blood pressure. And if there's low blood pressure, it'll send the signal to these nearby juxtaglomerular cells nearby right here. And these guys will secrete renin. This renin is a hormone and it gets dumped into the blood and it joins up with angiotensinogen which the liver makes hydrolyzes it into angiotensin 1 makes its way all the way up to the lungs where it's cleaved again by ACE and finally becomes angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. It causes the pituitary to secrete ADH what does AGH do for us? It allows us to increase blood volume. It increases the aquaporins and thereby increasing the water permeability, pulling water out and back into the blood. Causes the adrenal glands to also secrete aldosterone and causes the hypothalamus to initiate the thirst reflex. So angiotensin II does all kinds of stuff to help us when we have low blood pressure. It works to secrete ADH, more ADH, more aldosterone, and causes the hypothalamus to initiate the thirst reflex. All these things contribute to increase the water in our blood to reach blood homeostasis once again. Just a few things left and we are all done. We have these mesangial cells and they are the cells that, that surround the afferent and, and efferent arterials here and they they can they also uh, contribute and, and help control blood flow so the last thing I wanted to, 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 to talk about is the effects of caffeine and alcohol on on the on the nephron how do these guys what do these guys do to the nephron well simply put alcohol blocks ADH if alcohol blocks ADH and ADH is the stop P hormone, in other words, retaining water, alcohol will block it, and therefore we end up not retaining the water, and we pee out more water than we should, and therefore we become dehydrated, hence the hangover the next morning. Caffeine in the DCT inhibits normal sodium and chloride reabsorption. So if sodium generally is pulled out of the tube into the blood, that, that way water will be pulled out and therefore we increase blood pressure. And caffeine inhibits this normal reabsorption. 
then then we are not able to pull as much water out of the tube and into the blood and therefore caffeine that's how caffeine dehydrates us now it's important to note that the caffeine in our coffee doesn't have the dehydration effects that that people generally think why because it just isn't enough we because we also there's also water that we're drinking in the coffee the water is greater than the effects of the caffeine and therefore we are still being hydrated when we drink coffee the only the the, the real really the only way you would you would be end up being severely dehydrated is if you evaporated you know you just drink the just eat coffee without any water and you know that kind of thing okay so i think that covers everything thank you very much guys for watching i hope you found this video helpful study well and we'll see you next time